everyone. I'm Mandy Aguilar from North Texas Teen Book Festival and the Irving Public Library. And today we're doing something a little bit different. Instead of talking about teen literature, we are here with some amazing picture book authors and illustrators. So we'll be talking about uh, children's literature instead. For all of our friends who are watching us live, please be sure to leave comments uh, wherever you're watching and with questions for our authors, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. I would love to introduce our four fabulous authors. We have Vashti Harrison, Daria Peoples-Riley, Dan Santat, and Yuji Morales. Now I would love for all of you to tell us a little bit about yourselves and uh, the latest book that you'd like to talk about. Um, would anyone like to go first? Ladies first. <laughs> I can start. Uh, my name is Yuji Morales and I make picture books. I am in love with picture books. Um, I have uh, many books that I have written and illustrated as well. The one I wanted to share today, uh, my latest book is not the one I was going to share today, but I'll show it to you is Dreamers is the version of a Spanish, uh, a Spanish version of, uh, it's called Soñadores. Uh, this is my latest book, but the one I'm going to share with everybody today is actually the story of Nino, Nino Rosas the World. Um, this is one of my creations, kind of like my alter ego, kind of like that. And this is the book I'm going to be presenting. Wonderful. Who's next? I'll go next. All right. Um, so my name is Vashti Harrison. Um, I am an author and illustrator. And um, the books that I've written and illustrated are all technically middle grade. So they're collections of biographies of real people. But I also work as an illustrator and illustrate picture books like Soulway and Hair Love that you might have heard of. Um, my latest book is called Little Legends, Exceptional Men in Black History. But today, the one that I want to talk about is my second book, Little Dreamers, Visionary Women Around the World. Um, it's about women artists and scientists. And I put a lot of work into that book and didn't get to talk about it enough. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Daria, go ahead. I'm Daria Peoples-Riley. Um, I'm an author and illustrator of picture books. And the book that I'll be talking about today is my second book. Um, it is the companion book to This Is It. It's called I Got Next. And um, it's special to me because basketball is my first love. And um, I got to tell about it a little bit in a picture book. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, I am Dan Santat. I am a children's book author, illustrator. Uh, I also have been known to do some graphic novels. Um, the one that I think the, the site was plugging was After the Fall. This is actually one of my favorite books. This is a love letter to my wife and uh, how she overcame. I wouldn't say overcame, but she battled her depression and anxiety. Uh, but today, it just, it just occurred to me that today falls on the same day as a book release for this book, Little Fox and the Wild Imagination, uh, written by SNL writer and Lonely Island co-star, Mr. Yorma Takone, who will also be on Seth Meyers show tonight to talk about the book. Happy book birthday. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so all of you are both author and illustrator, and I was wondering if you have a favorite illustration in your book. Oh. Mm -hmm. I will go last on all questions. <laughs> 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 Ladies first, please. Um, I can start. So my book follows um, a very particular pattern. I use the same character on every single page and they're kind of positioned the same way. So the way I get to really be creative is with the background and with the costumes. Um, and one that I had a lot of fun with um, was one of my favorite artists. Um, 
sister, Karita Kent, um, who was a modern artist who worked in screen printing and made serographs. Um, she's very famous for these bold messages she made. I couldn't copy her work exactly, so I had to make my own Vashti version of her art, and I feel very proud of having done, done my best there. I also did one for um, Peggy Guggenheim, who collected very famous artworks, so I had to make my own version of like a Pollock and a Brunelleschi and had to put a lot of work into it. <laughs> Awesome. Who's next? I can go next. Uh, All right, with, with Minya Wrestles the World, uh, it's a story about a boy who is a wrestler, like in the tradition of the Mexican wrestling, which is called Lucha, Lucha Libre. And when I made this, this book, what I was actually doing was kind of like exercising my own fears. The things that I put in here, the, the beans that Nino wrestles against are things that I used to be afraid of when I was a little child. And what I did is then I created a story about them. I made paintings about them. And in a way that helped me get to know my, those, my fears a little better and, and kind of conquer them in that way, which is in a really playful way. It is in the way that you actually uh, get to know your fears a little better and then you end up even wrestling and playing with them. So one of my favorite, um, uh, it's not necessarily like my favorite image, but I love making the character of Cabeza Olmeca, which is this, this, this wrestler right here. Um, and here in Mexico, actually in the region where I was born, these Olmec heads are huge sculptures that were found buried in, 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 uh, in the ground. And they were made probably more than 3,000 years ago. And nobody really knows exactly who they are. They, they, so to me, when I was a child, I will hear about Cabeza Solmecas. I always thought that they were very mysterious. And uh, you might see like Cabeza Solmeca is made of uh, basalt rock. And he has kind of like a helmet. That's how they are depicted. That's how they were called. And when I was a child, some people will say that Cabeza Olmecas actually were beings that came from outer space to visit us here in Earth. And that then the, the humans here in Earth, the, the Mexicans, the ancient Mexicans, had created these sculptures um, inspired in this, these beings that have come to visit us and to me that blew my mind and 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 then <laughs> you know they became these very interesting and mysterious beings that then I recreated into a wrestler so that Nino will wrestle his fear um, for Cabeza Olmecas. Thank you. Daria? Yeah, I'll go with my end papers actually. Um, and I got next, which is here. It was um, a mural that um, I wanted to create. For me, public art was really, really important um, because <laughs> I hate to admit this, but I honestly had not walked into an art museum until probably four years ago. I didn't, I, I just didn't grow up with access to it but public art was always accessible to me. And it was really important that um, I really paid attention to it. And I wanted my readers to pay attention to public art as well and to look for art everywhere. So I wanted to open the book that way um, and make sure that it became a part of the character's story um, early on because it was like this reinvention of the beauty of where he lived. And um, I think that that's what art does for us in those public spaces. Beautiful, thank you. Dan? Uh, so I wouldn't say this was my, well, I guess I have a lot of favorites, but I, I don't think I can reveal my favorite because it's the actual, it's the ending of the book. So I don't want to spoil <laughs> the ending. Uh, but for most folks, uh, you know, whenever I talk about this book, this happens to be the favorite spread that everyone talks about. Um, and, and if you're not familiar with the story, uh, after the fall is what happens to Hempty Dumpty after he has fallen off the wall. And um, he, he basically, he becomes, uh, he, has a, he has a phobia for heights. He was afraid of heights. And so it really affects his life in ways that don't 
necessarily directly uh, have to do with uh, falling off a wall, but um, there are just moments in his life that he tries to avoid. Uh, and for example, here's a part where he's avoiding getting his favorite cereals, which are all on the top. Um, and you know, I think kids can relate because there's a lot of fun kids cereals, um, you know, things like uh, free toy. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's uh, there's sugar bunny and things like that. Funny thing is, I actually went to a I went to a, a store, uh, and they had like one of these like knockoff cereals, and there was one that was called uh, Fruit Rings, and and the crazy part was that the box was red. There was a green parrot, and it was called. <laughs> And I had called it Fruit Hoops, and it was just a really weird moment because I had illustrated the book before I saw the box of cereal, and I just had this weird, like, weird moment in my mind. But um, I mean, I think I think for me, like addressing uh, addressing the solution to the problem, just you know, with with uh, saturation of color, you know, having the really saturated colors on the top to be really appealing, and then all the unappealing grown-up cereals on the bottom, like uh, Fiber Flakes and Bland. Um, which are probably the cereals I would eat now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, this, is, this is just one of many spreads in this book that I'm particularly fond of. I will say, Dan, that when my six-year-old son and I read that book together, we spent the most time on that spread, <laughs> like looking at every single box of cereal and deciding which one would taste good and which one would be gross. <laughs> you come up with cereals and then you go out into the open and you're like, oh, it's not far off from what I thought of. <laughs> Um, okay, um, I wanted to just briefly touch on each of your books um, real fast. Um, Vashti, do you have a favorite subject in your book, in Little Dreamers? Mm -hmm. Well, so the entire book is about women artists and scientists, people who were visionaries, who were thinking about things long before many others. Um, so there are some there are a lot of themes that kind of connect with a lot of these women being that they were not appreciated in their time. They were often told they were crazy or too, too idealistic. Um, but um, in terms of specific subject, I suppose I have a soft spot for the artists. Um, I definitely have a soft spot for um, children's book illustrators. Um, so there's there are two two people who I lean on the most. Um, Gayo Fujikawa is one of my favorites because she was a pioneer in children's book illustrating. And then Mary Blair, who um, was an, a colorist um, who worked at the Disney Studios, but also illustrated children's picture books. So um, maybe the subject I like the most is creating stories and beautiful art for children. Thank you. Um, Daria, I noticed in both of your books, there's a shadow that is kind of following your main character. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the inspiration for that? Sure. Um, you know, I, when I talk to students about when I, when I take this is it and I got next to school visits, we talk about inner voice. And we talk about the ability of listening to that inner voice and whether or not it's a positive affirming uh, voice or if it's a negative voice. And so I wanted to give that voice a visual representation and what better to do that than our shadow because it's the one thing that follows us like our voice everywhere we go. And, um, but the voices in I Got Next and This Is It take on a personality of their own because that's really who we need to become within ourselves in order to see it you know, manifested in our life. So that's what I talk about. With This Is It, um, I, it was my very first book. It was my debut book. And so she really did take on the personality of Sasha Fierce, right? Like on the outside, you had this very insecure ballerina that did not want to show up for this audition. But um, on the inside, she had prepped and prepared. And um, so the Sasha Fierce had to present herself to her and remind her of who she was. And I got next is a similar voice, but is that more like a coach and that inner coach? Um, so many days when I was playing basketball, that's the thing about basketball is you can play yourself. And so um, a lot of that imagination happens in your mind where 
uh, your inner voice is, is the opponent um, and it's the coach as well that's getting you pre ready and prepared for the game. So that's what those shadows represent. Um, and it really was just a, a great device that I could use to um, show the inner workings of what voice sounds like and feels like and looks like on the outside. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for Juji. Um, you mentioned some of the, or at least one of the um, characters that Nino fights in the book. And I was wondering if you had any feedback from readers, if they had uh, a couple of favorites, what, which of the um, opponents really jumps out to your readers? Ooh, well, usually La Llorona. And La Llorona, I'm gonna look for her well. I represented her here, La Llorona. And La Llorona is, as soon as I mentioned the, the name La Llorona among children, especially Latino children, Latinx children, they immediately know what I'm talking about because La Llorona is the most Mexican, uh, the most famous Mexican ghost. And everybody has a story about La Llorona. Like, whether their uncles, their aunts, their cousins, abuelitos, abuelitas, had an encounter with La Llorona. Um, and the way that you recognize La Llorona is because she cries. And she cries something like this, like, ay, mis hijos. And when I was little, I never wanted to hear La Llorona, ever. But, most children know about La Llorona because whether they have been told by someone, they know that La Llorona was by the river or they hear her one night or something like that. Um, or they might have also been told that like, if you don't eat your soup, you know, La Llorona is gonna get you. And <laughs> children know La Llorona very much. And when I mention her, everybody immediately just breaks up and they are ready to, not so much sometimes to hear what I have to say or what the book has to say about La Llorona, but, but to tell me the stories that run in their family about encountering La Llorona. Thank you. Uh, I think when my husband read this with our son, uh, he mentioned uh, her as well because he was scared of her as a child. <laughs> oh, yes. We were all, yes. <laughs> um, and Dan, you mentioned that uh, after the fall was um, about your wife's anxiety and depression. Of course, anxiety is when we have um, fears that aren't necessarily real fears. How did that turn into a book about Humpty Dumpty? Um, you know, originally I just, I wanted to do a story that kids could relate to about um, just being, you know, being able to get back up after failure. Uh, I was relating it into a sense where, uh, you know, you talk about, you know, you talk about maybe falling off a bicycle or maybe not doing so well on a test and, you know, just having the courage to try to get up and, and, and get up again and, and try again. Uh, also just, you know, to normalize anxiety, to just realize that everybody goes through it and that it's, it's a thing that, you know, people, people have and deal with, um, you know, and then while I was working on the book, uh, I think what, what happened in the process was just, I like to, I, I get a lot of inspiration from, from family. Uh, you know, Beagle was about the birth of my son. Um, Are We There Yet was about my other son. And, uh, you know, after the fall, it just seemed, it just seemed perfect because uh, throughout the entire story, we're, we're working through, um, you know, uh, Humpty Dumpty Spears and, and also specifically, um, you know, the particular anxiety having to uh, affect components of his life because uh, what, what a person with anxiety typically does is try to avoid the triggers that, that enact them. So uh, in this particular story, you know, Humpty Dumpty is just trying to do everything he can to avoid going up to heights. So he won't get the, he won't get the cereal on the top shelf. Uh, in another spread, he, um, you know, he has a bunk bed and he, he's showing that he's preferring to sleep on the floor. Uh, and things like that. But, um, you know, with the help of my editor, this wonderful editor, her name's Connie Shu over at Macmillan, uh, you know, we, we were just working on different solutions for the ending. And uh, originally, like, what I had proposed was that uh, Humpty Dumpty was missing one piece and it was still back on the top of the wall. And in order for him to feel whole again, 
Um, you know, he had to climb the wall to get that piece. Uh, but that gives mixed messages because that kind of alludes more to perfectionism than it is about overcoming anxiety. Uh, and then, we, you know, we, we finally came up with a, a, a different ending and it, it just, it just felt perfect. And then, um, as a result, I think that activated a, a light in my head and everything just really kind of was inspired by what my wife had to go through to overcome her anxiety. Uh, so much so that, um, you know, she, she ended up getting a, after the fall theme tattoo on her back. And, awesome. then, and then I did too. So we had this, this bird feather because birds are significant in the book. And so now she and I, we both have like tattooed bird feathers on our body. So we're married forever now. <laughs> Kill the deal. <laughs> now it's, now it's, now it's a seal. <laughs> um, so um, all of your books are um, fantastic in so many different ways. Um, great story, wonderful illustrations. Um, showing um, all of the different types of stories that we have in our country and our world. Um, and I was wondering if um, there was a book or a type of book that you wished had been around when you were a kid, like your books are around for our next generation. Um, I'll go first. I, you know, I thought about um, that question and I think what I would how I would like to answer it is I wish that the books that were around were available to me. Um, I, I wish that librarians had put Eloise Greenfield and Walter D. Myers on my bookshelves um, because there were so many books that were available um, to me during my childhood, but I didn't have access to those. Mm. Um, and so that's why I think it's so important the role of librarians and in teachers to make sure that those books that are out there are on the bookshelves. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I really wish. Um, I've talked a lot about how my first book, Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History, I really kind of made it with a younger version of myself in mind. Um, now I could have talked about the most famous leaders in all of history, but I focus specifically um, on American women because it was inspired by American um, Black History Month in America, but also um, I made sure to include um, kind of as diverse a list of possible of fields of study because there's a question that lots of adults ask kids very often. <laughs> And I'm not sure I loved this question so much, but it's what do you want to be when you grow up? And I don't think that anyone needs to know that answer anytime soon or, you know, sooner than they're ready. But I wanted to make sure that I was kind of arming kids with the knowledge of all these different possibilities that exist. So in this book, there are authors and illustrators and sculptors and filmmakers and mathematicians and doctors and lawyers. Um, you know, I could have, there were so many incredible people I could have put in here, but I made sure to kind of diversify the, the, the fields of study just to make sure there was something on every page for, um, for everyone. Um, because I never saw books that had characters that looked like me and they certainly weren't doing all of these different things. And I always thought, what if I learned about filmmaking or if I'd learned about animation or or children's book illustrating when I was younger. And maybe I could have spent a little less time <laughs> filled with anxiety. Um, so that's definitely, you know, I've, I've you know, said that answer before, so I was trying to find something new, but there's still so much to be said about how, you know, these versions, you know, in the, in the intro to the book, I say to be able to see someone um, that looks like you do these things, it's, it's just, it's eye-opening and it's an empowering and still there's so much, um, so many more stories to share. Absolutely. I learned so much reading the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, I'll go. Um, I, I grew up here in Mexico. I'm in Mexico right now. And when I was growing up in this country and in my generation, we didn't really have children's literature. So when you pose the question, what books I would have loved to have available during my childhood is 
all the books that right now are being made. Uh, and and it, it makes me, um, I actually brought this one, Vamos, by Raul III, which is just, it really depicts what it is to be someone like, like, like me, maybe who likes to go to the street taco truck or that will eat uh, tortillas made by this lady. Uh, and not only there weren't books for children when I was growing up here in Mexico, but much less there were books that will depict someone like me. One of the first surprises I got when I, when I moved to the United States, I was already an adult. And I was surprised first to find out that there was a body of children's literature. Later, I was even more surprised to see that there were some books, and because this was a while ago, so it was just a handful, but there, there were books made by and about people like me and my son who were uh, darker color, who maybe didn't speak English or that wasn't our first language, that came from a different country, that maybe uh, lived in the barrio or ate things like the things that I ate. And that was such an amazing thing that it really opened up the possibilities, the whole possibilities for what anyone could do. Uh, and now that we see artists like Raul III and many other uh, authors and illustrators making these books, I just get excited and, and even emotional when I see the work that they are doing. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and for me, I think, um, I don't know, a particular genre, I don't, I don't know what you could say. I guess, I guess own voices is a relevant uh, answer. Um, you know, you know, I, I grew up in a I grew up in a, a very uh, white rural town, uh, very you know just very Christian and uh, like just quiet. Did Dan freeze for everyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Dan, come back to us. <laughs> All right, I'll send a little chat, I guess. Yeah. In the meantime, um, <laughs> while we wait to get Dan back, the last thing I wanted to do before we went to audience questions, and we've had quite a few coming in, which is awesome, um, is uh, if you guys would like to show us a little bit about how um, your artwork is created, and that can be anything from um, share your screen to um, draw with us, or um, if you want to show us on a, a sketch pad or um, a, a, a rough draft of something, um, we would love to see a little little sneak peek at the process. And would anyone like to volunteer to go first? I can go first. Uh, right now I'm working in a book and the way I usually start is with notes. So I have actually here my sketchbook with notes and you might not see a lot. These are just the studies that I've been doing. Uh, and after I, I come up with notes and just drawings, things that I copy, I use references and then I, I look at them a lot then I usually start making the small drawings. But the, the, the small drawings I'm gonna show you are actually from my book, um, Nino. And let me see, we can use this, I think. Because my drawings, let me see, I'm gonna get a piece of paper so I can show you because I use this tracing paper to make very, very small drawings. And you might see them, they are kind of like ants. Hmm? You barely see them. Because to me, it's very important that the seed of the book and the seed of the images um, is something that I can, I, I can hold them. I am okay with them. This might happen to many of you that when you try to create something, sometimes the task seems so enormous that you freeze. 
that happens to me a lot. So I try to start in a way that doesn't intimidate me. Something that I can easily erase and draw again. Hi, then. <laughs> I don't want to hold things up so we can keep rolling. I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Well, you can go next and then you tell us. <laughs> it was really interesting. It was really interesting. Come on. So right now, Diamond, just telling them a little bit of how I make my, my books, how I start. Oh, yeah, then go books. ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And what I was telling them is that most of the time, I don't even feel very capable. So I, I try to help myself by starting with very little things. And one of those is like the sketches that I show you, and they're just so tiny, you can barely see them. But from that, then I kind of start growing things. And then uh, I'm gonna show you, then I will make a drawing, and then I will make it more refined, something like this, these are Las Hermanitas having a tantrum. And I told you before about Cabeza Olmeca, and then I made a more refined drawing of Cabeza Olmeca. So most lately, I do a lot of things by hand on my drawing table, including painting papers and doing the line drawings, like I paint papers with my acrylics and just make different colors with textures because then eventually I'm going to put all of that inside of my computer. And inside of my computer, I'm going to paint pretty much in the same way I will paint as if I have my brushes and jars of paint out here. But now I do it in the computer because it allows me a lot more flexibility and choices, but it's not very differently. I, I use my pen with my tablet and once I have a scan everything in there, I start coloring the, the, the work that I have with me. And eventually one day it will become a book. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Dan, no. did you wanna go next so that you could finish uh, talking while you show us your work? Uh, sure, so pertaining to the last question, American born Chinese, that's my answer. Uh, <laughs> You know, like I, I grew up, you know, just as a lonely Asian kid and that book, that book spoke to my soul. And, you know, um, I just think it's important that, you know, when you have a community of, of diverse people all across the country, like just it, there's a really huge impact that comes when you are when you feel like there's a book that's made specifically for you. So like, you know, any book out there, I think is amazing. Um, now, to answer the question about my technique, uh, I'm, I'm very similar to Juji where um, I'm, I'm just doing like random textures like this, just scanning it into my computer and just, you know, while my wife and I are watching 90 Day Fiance, I'll just, I'll turn my brain off and, and just make like random textures and then, and I'll scan them in. Uh, and let's see, I'll, I'll break on to my, I'll show you my process here on my computer. So, um, you know, I work on an iMac. Um, the reason why I do a lot of computer work is because uh, a lot of the time um, I'm just working on multiple projects at once. So like currently, currently I'm working on four different books, two of which are graphic novels. And so I'm constantly juggling projects. Um, so I work on an iMac. Um, you know, I work on a drawing tablet. Um, I, I've moved up to a, a Wacom Cintiq, which is basically like a, a video screen that you can draw on. And then you have this really nice digital pen where you can, you can draw on the surface and it shows up. Uh, on the screen using a program like uh, Adobe Photoshop. Um, it's a very powerful tool. You can do a lot of amazing things. So like, for example, uh, if we take the Crate and Barrel catalog, like here, uh, if I wanted to, I could just, I could photo shop myself into it. And, you know, I can have a nice COVID free barbecue with this guy here on page 42. Um, or, you know, we have this nice little dining set here. And again, like, I don't have the time to go to Crate and Barrel to check things out, but, you know, with Photoshop, I can put myself in that page and just enjoy a nice little orange in the in the catalog. Um, here's an example of a book cover that I've done. Uh, usually what happens is that the art director will call me and then we'll do sketches. Uh, and then once the, the sketches are approved, um, depending on how I want to approach it, this is a purely digital approach. Um, I, I, treat, I treat coloring uh, on Photoshop very much like painting with acrylics and, and the idea with acrylics is that you do your darkest first and then you pull out the lights. So you're working backwards as opposed to like watercolor 
where you do your lights and then you work in your darks. So I'm gonna go through a quick process of uh, how I go through this. Uh, I'm basically blocking in my colors and then you just start rendering little pieces at a time and you're pulling in, you know, you're pulling out your highlights slowly. Like so, wow. and so something like this, something like this, I, you know, I, I've been, I've been doing this for about 16, 17 years. So uh, I, I can knock something like this out in about a day. Um, but I, again, like going back to my old process, my new process, because over years, like, it, you know, just doing purely digital work can sometimes get a little stale and, and you just, you're just kind of itching to get back to like a tactile medium. Uh, so a book like Drawn Together was a little bit more different. I was doing a lot of collage with a lot of uh, existing textures that I made with real media, like paint brushes and watercolors and things like that, and, and creating artwork that had a little different feel than, than what you probably have normally seen over the years. Um, and again, like I'm doing a lot of my, uh, my artwork with uh, pen and ink on paper, and I'll scan in all those elements along with all the textures. And then Photoshop basically is just this device that I'm using to collage everything together. Um, so I might scan uh, an ink drawing like this and then, uh, you know, a paint stroke here and then slowly I'm just adding layers in Photoshop, you know, just coloring it with, you know, like marker pens and things like that, creating alpha channels and, you know, all this really specific jargon that you have in, in Photoshop and uh, just slowly working at the piece until it feels right. Um, you know, there's a fairly new technique for me. So, you know, at, at one point it was easier for me to say, oh, this piece is done, but now um, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more abstract. And so you have to feel, you kind of have to feel your way around whether or not you think the piece is right. Uh, and so something like this, like the completion time varies. It can be anywhere from one day to two weeks. Um, but this is how, this is how I do a majority of my work, uh, now. Awesome. Thank you. Um, who wants to go next? Um, I'll go next. Okay. I'm also going to share my screen. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit from uh, from this book, Solway, that I illustrated. Um, just be, so you can see a little bit more of the like the painting process, the art process. So um, this is a sample drawing. So sometimes when I get asked to illust illustrate a book, I have to do a sample drawing early on before anything else to kind of show that I've got the chops to do it or that, you know, the, the team can kind of choose between a couple of different artists. Um, but once, once I was locked in, I was the illustrator, I started really working on the character. Um, Solway is a story about a little girl who has very dark skin and has to learn to to love it. Um, so I did a ton of character sketches in lots of different media. This is like marker on paper. Um, here I was really testing out different face shapes because her skin is very dark and the first line of the book is Silk Suwei's skin is the color of midnight. So I thought, well, you know, maybe it's important that she has these really big eyes because maybe that's the only thing we see in some scenes or, you know, I need her, her features to kind of really pop out, um, you know, in potentially these really dark scenes. Eventually, um, let's see. Eventually, this is the one that, in this case, um, Lupita Nyong'o, the author, she had um, a lot of say in the book. So this is the one that she went with. Um, and so I started really working on breaking down the character um, and doing all these different emotions because Lupita is an actress and I, wasn't, I knew early going in that she was going to want to talk about these little subtle acting things that the character was going to need to do. And I was like, Whew, that's a lot of work, but I'm going to practice. Um, so I do a lot of sketches in, you know, in all different types of media. Um, I make a color palette pretty early on to kind of decide where things are going to go. Um, I try to be really thoughtful about, you know, my, what colors complement each other and how I can relate that to the different characters. So for example, um, this is Solway's color um, and uh, her exact complement, I always put her mother in. Um, so the colors are always kind of harmonious in, in those scenes. Um, but it was really important to ask myself questions about like, well, when Solway goes on a ride to the stars, what is the color? of night 
And what is the color of the character night? What is the color of a star? And what is the color of our character named day? And so I needed to find this hierarchy between what's the brightest thing in the scene and what's the darkest in the scene. And it, was, um, it was a lot of fun, but also like a lot of thinking, a lot of planning goes into it. So here's kind of a breakdown of where I start out. So I do these thumbnail sketches. They're pretty small. I don't put a lot of thought into trying to get everything perfect. I just try to get the emotion. And usually that requires some light and dark, some values to, to help me feel like where is the, what is the mood of the scene? Um, so once the character was kind of approved, I went back in and did the sketch phase with that character design. Um, and there's the, the color. I usually go pretty quickly from sketch to color. Sometimes I don't even uh, sketch too much. Um, so this is like, this is a classic Vashti sketch. This is me working out where things are gonna go on the page of the composition. And in my head, I got the rest of it. But when you're working with a client, sometimes you do have to clean things up so they understand exactly where things are gonna go. So. Um, whereas I might go from here to final, <laughs> I needed to <laughs> clean things up. Um, so here's the full sketch. So the character is, uh, she's here sitting on her bed. I think this says her room. That's enough for me. Um, and she's thinking about um, her sister and all of her friends that she doesn't have. It's very sad. Um, so I redid it um, digitally. And so here you can see some of the lights and the darks that where the values are. And then I did it again with the color, with the character sketches, and then that's the actual final piece. Awesome. So that's that's Sulway, but I wanted to show you really quickly um, a little bit of of little leader. So in these books, all the characters are the same. Um, I use the same face. Um, and I just changed the background and the costumes. And in this way, I kind of hoped that it would feel like kind of like a little animation, like a flip book, like maybe any one of these, uh, like a kid could be dressing up as any one of these people and see a little bit of themselves in any single one of them. So I made this coloring page where you can uh, color it in and show um, someone that inspires you. And just to show people how it works, I drew my parents. Oh, so my mom. She, she used to have short hair. This I gotta redo it with some longer hair, but she's got her iconic gold eyeshadow and her boots and she's always in these kind of neutral colors. And then, cause I couldn't leave him out. Here's my dad. <laughs> I love it. My dad's like iconic, got this iconic sideways haircut, but I was like, oh no, no, no. My dad always has a hat on. So I gotta add the hat. Um, and he always wears a Tampa Bay hat, but he tells people it stands for teddy bear because his name is Ted. <laughs> so that's just a little bit of my work. Thank you. All right, and Daria? Yes, I'll try to screen share, here we go. <laughs> So every book that I make, I kind of create it a little bit different. Um, I like the book to inform the feel of it. And also, I mean, to be quite honest, I'm still really growing as an artist. So I like to explore a lot of different things right now. Um, and so with I Got Next, I kind of felt myself moving away from, um, usually I would hand paint everything with gouache and go in um, material wise, but I wanted like the actual thing of what inspired me to kind of change a little bit with I Got Next and see how that informed the book. Um, I knew that basketball narratives had been in picture books for a really long time. Um, so the first thing I did was I read all the basketball stories that I was familiar with and that I wasn't <laughs> familiar with. But some of my favorite illustrators have done basketball books before. And so I wanted to know also like what part of the story could I tell that was different than what was already out there on the, in the market. And that's where I came up with the idea I got next with it being, you know, this lingo that is used on the basketball court to mean that you're the next person on the court. Well, when you're the smallest person or the youngest person or the only girl on the court, that could be hard to say in those words. And so that's kind of where the story idea came from. 
And um, as I mentioned before, I don't have a traditional art background. So I really do lean in on inspirational art from everywhere that I can possibly find it and how I'm going to incorporate what I'm learning as I'm learning into the books that I'm creating. Um, and so I look for art all over to inspire my colors, the design, um, just everything that I can possibly uh, glean from uh, the world around me. So as you can see, um, the public art became uh, the beginning of I Got Next and it's on the title page as well. It ends up in the world of number one as you move through uh, the book. And that's kind of how that, that was inspired um, along the way. And then um, I was kind of creating this book, not in any particular order, definitely not like how I did This Is It with thumbnails and character designs and kind of a step-by-step um, -step process. I really was trying just to feel the world and remember what it was like to be nine years old again and play. And that reminded me of my grandmother. This is my grandmother and my daughter um, some years back. Today is her birthday. She's 97 hey. years old. So I wanted to wish her a happy birthday, but Momo played basketball. And I remembered that. And I remembered that that was something that I shared with her. It was something that she passed on to my father who passed it on to me. And I really wanted to, um, evoke her very favorite color was purples and pinks and that's part of her story that I incorporated into um, I Got Next. Also my son is a basketball player um, and my husband coaches basketball as well and played and is just a big part of our family and one of the things that he loves doing right before basketball practice is I mean games is getting his hair cut you need a fresh cut to play in right so that's how the story began and he really inspired that and as you can tell down here are my sketches and I really I love paper uh, and pencil and charcoal and I do all of my sketches just like that and photocopy them and there's smudges all over them and my or dear editor, Martha, she, she has to <laughs> deal with the, the smudgy papers and everything um, until I get to, to the final art stage. But um, I really just was trying to let the world inspire me for this particular uh, book. And I really wanted to go to Brooklyn. I've always been in love with the, with the courts of Brooklyn and, and the legends of the legacy of basketball there. But at that time uh, in my life, I couldn't travel. And it was actually my editor who suggested I take some Google Walks. And that's one of the things <laughs> that I did uh, to really feel as though I was there, you know? Um, and, uh, I, and it really inspired me. I did have the opportunity to go to Washington DC and I made my friend who I was traveling with pull over when I saw a basketball court and that inspired it as well. Um, but it really was a book that I made along the way um, and figured things out till the very last minute. Um, and I also had the opportunity to go watch my nephews play, which really gave me a good idea of like the players, and the scale of the court. Cause you know, when you're big and old, you forget how little you are on that big old court and how high that basket is. And um, how intimidating that could be. Um, and so watching him practice with his buddies and friends like really helped me figure out the scale and the size of the court and what I, the different angles and perspectives that I wanted it to have. And lately I've been learning, um, my next book is coming out in April and the whole book is created with oil paints and I went completely 100% traditional. And this is kind of the process that I, that I learned. Um, I have the opportunity of being mentored by Floyd Cooper and it's been a wonderful experience. He's like the master of subtractive painting and he kind of helped me see the way I see and then figure out how to paint um, in a way that I really enjoyed it. Um, so this is kind of the process for how I painted those paintings and um, America, my love, America, my heart. Um, and it's very traditional, but it's new to me and I've really been enjoying it. Thank you. All right, um, we are getting close. Oh, I'm sorry, did you have a little bit more? No, I'm just kind of trying to figure out how to not screen share anymore. 
<laughs> Maybe can you kick me off? There's a there's a tab on the top of the screen that'll say stop sharing. It's a red button. There we go. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we are getting a little bit close to the end, um, but I wanted some time to do audience questions. We've had uh, quite a few great ones come in. Um, and the first one, and, and also because we're starting to run out of time just a little bit, um, let's try to keep the answers as sh short, but um, you know, good as we can. Um, and our first question that came from Facebook um, from an 11 year old fan, Allison. Um, and she wants, she's from Texas, which is great. She loves and has read all of your books and wants to know that when you started to write, were there any bumps in the road? And how did you, um, how did you help yourself not give up basically? Uh, I, I, I learned how to write from reading other books. And then I think, I think the, I think the easiest way to ease into it is to try to imitate other people until you feel comfortable. And then you just set out on your own and try to write your own stuff. I mean, there's nothing wrong with fan fiction, really, <laughs> you know. When I was a kid, long before I ever thought I would be an illustrator, when I was in high school, I was really, really insecure about my writing ability, so much so that it was giving me, uh, like, nightmares before my senior year of high school and so I didn't take AP English and I for a long time thought I was such a bad writer but what that meant was when I got to college I had to take my English writing requirement and fortunately there since everyone has to take these classes there are lots of different options so you could take one on rock and roll you can take one on politics. I ended up taking one on film and I loved it so much. It was the first time I ever took a film class. And I realized once I had something that I wanted to say, my fear of writing disappeared. And just the act of being forced to write five, five page papers, it was like, you know, I don't have time to slow down. I'm just trying to get these ideas out. And I realized that I got over my fear pretty quickly once I just forced myself to do it. And I realized I had something to say. Awesome. I would say um, talk about your writing with your friends. If you have another writing partner or somebody who likes to write along with you, when you talk things out, a lot of times it helps you go back to your own writing and incorporate what you really meant to say in your writing. Um, and that, that helps me a lot when I just talk things out. Um, and I have friends that really want to talk about it all day because it kind of takes all day sometimes to figure things out. Um, for me, when I start, when I start admiring picture books, I wanted to write them and I had no idea how to do it. Also, I wanted to write them and I didn't even uh, know enough English to do it. So I started a process of writing and learning and I didn't have really anybody to share them with and I but eventually I did find people that had the same the same likes and the same passion for writing for also for making images and that really helped me because then then you start sharing and they have the patience to for you to share your work and 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 you can see that it can grab someone's interest. But at the same time, I feel like if we are gonna wait for someone to tell us, oh, what you wrote, you know, I really like it or I don't like it. When you are creating, your creation is so tender, is so fragile because it is just the beginning. So I will say that be very, very proud of whatever you do and be very caring of it. Don't, um, if you don't feel like sharing it, don't share it. It is yours and it is yours and that's all that counts. It is your voice is what you wanna say, no matter that it doesn't look like anybody else's. It is your own creation and you have to be very protective of it because if you just show it there and put it out there, you might find people who will not take the same care and might just break you. It might break what you are doing and you decide like, oh, I'm not good at doing this and I'm just not good writing, I'm not good illustrator, so I'm gonna stop. Do not stop. Sometimes you might not have someone 
that supports you, that takes you by her or his hand. So you're gonna have to be your own hand. You're gonna have to be your own reader. And you're gonna have to say the story I'm writing, the images I'm creating, they are valid because I made them. Oh, that's powerful. Thank you. Um, just enough time for one or two more questions. Um, Charlotte from YouTube and Catherine from Facebook um, both wanted to know about writing and illustrating. Um, what comes first? Um, does it kind of depend? Can you talk us quickly uh, through that? For me, they come at the same time. Some pages are words, some pages are illustrations. I go back and forth and I figure it out throughout the whole thing. And I don't get one or the other first or second. Um, yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? Yeah, for me, this is, is very similar too. But at the same time, usually I start with the words, uh, but the words will be changing as I'm making the illustrations because <laughs> especially picture books are so much um, a conversation between these many ways of telling a story, which are not only words and not only images. Sometimes is the way that you, pay, you, you pass the page, the, the colors that you use, and even the empty spaces. So when you integrate all of these things together, you finally are telling the story. So it, they, they might take turns for me. I do want to say for, for nonfiction, it has been always more helpful for me to do as much research as I can before going into the illustrations because I've made some mistakes and some oversights by putting things into the art that were not reflective of how that care, that person may have felt politically or emotionally about some subjects. So in some cases, I'm always doing sketches while I'm researching and I might put a lot of ideas down early, but I, it's usually, for in the case of these books, they're very much informed by the research. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a push and pull process. So uh, for the concept is tantamount. It's the most important part of the entire thing. And uh, you know, sometimes you might be able to illustrate what you wanna say better than how you can express into words. And so typically, typically when I make a picture book, I'm actually, I actually go through the illustrations first. I'm doing a, a wordless picture book first. Uh, and then if there's things in the narrative of the illustrations that aren't clear, that's when I start putting in, that's that when I start putting in the words. And, and I mean, from that process, I just find that the usage of words can be very economical, but also gives you an opportunity to be pretty poetic because you're not wasting your effort trying to describe the scene. All right. Um, oh, hi, kitty cat. <laughs> we have a kitty cat on the screen. Um, one last question, and I'm sorry to everyone whose questions we didn't quite get to, uh, but we do kind of have to keep um, the time in mind. Um, so the last question is one of my favorite questions to ask authors, um, and it came from Sandra on Facebook, and she wants to know if there is an author that you all look up to or who has influenced you. This is a great time to plug a favorite's work. Uh -huh. <laughs> to me, my the, the author that influenced me when I was a kid uh, was Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And what happened with him is that he, when I identify with his stories, I realized that I was a reader, something that I had not realized before. Thank you. My favorite book and my favorite author is Ashley Bryan, uh, Beautiful Blackbird. I really love the works of Gayo Fujikawa just because she's a master of characters and color and she's, she was one of the pioneers of uh, creating books that feature diverse characters and, and just all around beautiful artist. Uh, my favorite writer, he doesn't do children's books, but uh, he, he has, I love his tone, it's David Sedaris. Uh, and one of my favorite books is Me Talk Pretty One Day. Uh, you know, not all of this stuff is appropriate for kids, uh, but you might, if you want to go on NPR and download an episode of This American Life, there are times when he uh, tells stories, uh, particularly ones about being a, a, a Santa elf at Macy's and just talking about like singing like Billie Holiday in line to entertain people. So it's a fantastic writer. 
Awesome. Well, I want to thank all four of you for taking an hour out of your day um, to talk with us about your books. Um, I think this has been such an illuminating panel um, and I can't wait for um, it to be shared um, with lots of different readers of all ages um, because it will be recorded um, and re-uploaded to our YouTube channel um, for everyone to look at um, very soon. Um, I also want to let our, our audience know um, that on Saturday, September 12th at 2 p.m., we have our next panel, um, which is uh, more of a middle grade panel. Um, it's Rick Riordan Presents, um, and it's J.C. Cervantes, Kwame Mabalia, and Taylor K. Mejia. So that's on Saturday uh, uh, at 2, September 12th. Um, and once again, thank you all so much. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for the wonderful books that you're putting out into the world. Thank, Thank you. It's an honor to be on the Thank panel. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.